warahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We're going to recite Surat Surat Hud, uh, three verses from Surat Hud, 15, 16, and 17, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. والصلاة والسلام على أنبياء الله جميعا وعلى سيدهم وخاتمهم حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم من كان يريد الحياة الدنيا وزينتها نوفي إليهم أعمالهم فيها وهم فيها لا يبخسون أولئك الذين ليس لهم في الآخرة إلا النار وحبط ما صنعوا فيها وباطل ما كانوا يعملون أفمن كان على بينة من ربه ويتلوه شاهد منه ومن قبله كتاب موسى كتاب موسى إماما ورحمة أولئك يؤمنون به ومن يكفر به من الأحزاب فالنار موعده فلا تك في مرية منه إنه الحق من ربك ولكن أكثر الناس لا يؤمنون صدق الله العلي العظيم There are two perceptions of this life, two ways of understanding this life. There is a group of people who understand this life as being the ultimate destination. This is the beginning and this is the end and there is nothing beyond that. Nothing beyond that. Whatever they tell you about after death, they say it's superstition. It's a myth. It's an irrational belief. Nothing is beyond and after this physical, material life. Many people believe in this. The second group believe that this life is only a connector connects two places together, two abodes together. It's a connector. It's a bridge. And therefore, we pass over the bridge. It's called an overpass. We don't stop. We can't stop on the bridge. It's, it's too dangerous. We have to move. Look at yourself. You can't take a break in this life. Look at your age. Remember the day you were born and you went to the elementary school and then middle school and high school and college and you know, the day you got married, the day you got your first son or daughter. It's like a dream. So there is no halt. There is no stop. This life is moving. Can you feel the week, the seven days? You can't feel it. 
neither the month nor the year. When did 2007 begin? The other night. 2011 is coming soon. 2000, what did I say? See, this is, this is a proof that we even do not remember the year. We don't, we barely remember, try to say 2017 and then 2018 and 19 and others they come. This means that we are moving to the final destination. This life is only a connector. The first group who see nothing but this lower life, they put all their effort and energy in the investment in this life. Because they don't see any other real beyond this. This is their main goal. For them, this life is limited and confined in materialism. There is no room for ma'nawiyat. It's only about maddiyat. No room for spiritualities. And this is why this verse in Surah Hud, number 15. Man kana yuridu al-hayat al-dunya. Whosoever desires this lower life, al-hayat al-dunya, lower. Dunya from the lower one. The short one. Nuwafi ilayhim wazinataha and its attraction and adornment. Whoever puts his goal on materialism and only materialism and nothing else definitely will give them materialism. In full. Nuwafi means we give in full without any shortage. نوفي إليهم أعمالهم فيها وهم فيها لا يبخسون. Whoever seeks only materialism, definitely we're going to give him or her materialism. We will give them this life, no problem, no problem. If they are serious, if they are hardworking, if they play by the rules, definitely they're going to obtain the materialism, the gains, material gains of this life. They're going to make money, lots of money. نوفي إليهم أعمالهم فيها وهم فيها لا يبخسون. But then their production is going to be short-lived. What they produce, what they present, what they save, it's not going to last. It's going to be short-lived. By the time they die, everything comes to conclusion. The wealth that they accumulated and they focused on is not going to help them after death because their only focus was just this life, materialism, nothing else. They enjoy it as long as they live. The moment they die, they lose everything. While the second group, if people, they seek the Akhirah, they enjoy this life, but at the same time, at the same time, their aim, their final goal and ultimate goal is that one, not this one. Definitely, they should not forget about their share here. They have to have a decent life here. The one who does not care about his living here, he doesn't have a decent living here, he cannot make a decent living there too. So you cannot abandon this life. God does not want you to live in a shelter or be a homeless. No, definitely this is not his aim. He says you may lead, you may have a decent life here. But don't be attached to this one because soon you're going to depart. We're going to send you somewhere else. That is the real life. So if you invest, you have to invest 90% of your energy, your work, your deeds, your efforts for the next one. Maybe you take 10% here, but 90% send it elsewhere. Save it for the next one. Through what? Through helping others. While you live, try to provide living 
decent living for others, relief for others, help for others. If you put others, then definitely you're going to enjoy this life and you're going to invest for the next one too. Now, there is a very important question here. How can we distinguish between the work that is material, maddi, and the work that is ma'nawi, spiritual? How can we distinguish? How do we know that this is only for this life, but the second one is for this life and the hereafter? How do we distinguish between them? We distinguish through something very important. We all have it. We all have it. We don't want, we don't need to go and ask others about it. We have it. It's inside us. It is inside our thoughts. It's here in your brain. You carry it with you. And that is the intention, the niya. What is your intention? When you do this act, what is your intention? Is your intention just yourself, to serve yourself, to help yourself, or to help others? If our intention is only to serve ourselves and we don't care about others, we put ourselves before our communities, before our societies, before our people, before our families, then we become very selfish. Then we think only in terms of materialism, material gain, nothing else. But if we think of ourselves and others, the society, I belong to a community, I belong to a group of humans, people who have soul, people who have mind, people who have hearts, People who have aspirations. I'm not an animal. An animal can think of food, only food. But an animal does not have other aspirations. But we, the humans, we were not created to eat. Yes, we eat to survive, but our aim is not to eat. We eat to work, to produce. We don't work to eat. This is wrong. You eat in order for you to give, to help, to serve. But you don't live to eat. We don't live to eat. This is not our goal. We have aspirations. We're going to be resurrected. We're going to be again, we'll be, we will be resurrected and come back again, and there is another life waiting for us. So if we put the society before ourselves, this is a strong indication that your work is spiritual and moral, not material. Whatever you do, this is moral. You are thinking of protecting your community, your society, the people around you. Be a moral being. This is the difference. The second difference, so the first difference is the niya, the intention. What is your intention? When you open a business, when you go to work, when you leave your house, what is your intention? Just yourself or others? Simple examination. You can answer it yourself. It's a self-examination. We examine our intentions. If your intention is to help others, then you are a moral being. Then your work is not just material. Your work, true it's material, but it has spiritual aims and aspirations and goals. The second difference between a material work and a spiritual work is what? Is that we learned from the history of mankind, from many stories, many experiences, many incidents around us, that mater only material gains, 
they don't last forever. They come to conclusion. When you just work for yourself, that work is not going to last forever. But if you work for God and the humanity, that one is going to live forever. That one is going to stay forever. Ma kana lillahi yanmu, the hadith says. Whatever job you do, whatever work, whatever production, whatever motion or movement you have, if it is for God, it will remain. You will see the benefit. Even after our departure. We will see the benefit. But if we work for ourselves, just ourselves, we don't care about the humanity, then that one will come to conclusion. Each and every person of us, my friends, my brothers and sisters, each and every person of us should think of how life is going to remember us after our death. It depends on us. Sometimes we can write and type our eulogies ourselves, not people, we. And people read it after our death. We do it ourselves. Do you want people to remember you as someone who always put the society before himself? Who always rushed to help people who are distressed, people who are lost, people who are confused, people who have been abandoned, this person was always there. We see him always there. Do you want to be remembered like that? Or do you want to be remembered by nothing? Hundreds of people, thousands of people, they die every day. No one remembers them. Gone with the wind. Nobody remembers them. Very few are remembered. Very few are remembered. Those of you who puts others before themselves. Those of you who believe in sacrifice. They practice sacrifice. Every day is a day of sacrifice for them. Every day is a day of opportunity to progress. To progress morally, spiritually, ethically. They grow. Every day they grow. Every day they grow. Those people are going to be remembered. History is going to remember them. So we should live, we should think seriously now of the legacy we're going to leave behind. Your legacy is very important. Live in a way that people are going to remember you with goodness. People are really going to, to miss you. They really miss you. You leave a huge vacuum in your community, in your society. This is the difference. God says, for the first group who put themselves first, we're going to give them in this life. God is not stingy. God says, if you work hard, even if you don't believe in me, you're going to be successful, but only in this life. But then, number 16 says, You come to that life empty-handed. Because your aim was not that life. You did not even think of that life. And God is just. God is just. God like a teacher. Principal of a school. Some students are hardworking and serious. Some of them are lazy. So the teacher would not send the lazy one, would not reward him. Because this is injustice. This is injustice for those who are working hard. For those who are serious, the teacher says, you, the serious guy, you had an aim of going to the best school, to the best college, to the best university. Therefore, you are rewarded. But that one had no aim. I can't send him to the best school, to the best university. He's a dropout. The same thing with God. Even those who think that they're going to be successful in this life through material success, their success is a fake success, not real success. Because they are not going to find real happiness. 
Material people are never happy in this life, believe me. Material people are selfish. And a selfish person, he might gain every wealth in this life except happiness. He or she would not be happy for the rest of their life. Even if they are the richest and the most powerful, but they can't gain happiness. Because happiness is not purchased by money. Happiness is the production of your life, your work, your effort, your sincerity, your direction, your heart. This is how you become happy. Today, no pharmacy, no hospital, no corporation sells happiness. They could sell everything, but they can't sell happiness. Happiness, we have to gain it. We have to earn it through our work. Through our work, through our intention, through our hearts, through our souls. We can build a happy life through our work. And we can become miserable again through our work. So even material gain, Quran says, is not the real happiness, is not the real success. On the other hand, there are some people who are not very rich, but they are extremely happy. I have seen this in America and outside America. I have been to communities who live sometimes in makeshift homes. Their homes are not solid, makeshift, but they are always smiling. They are content with their life. They are content and they are very hardworking, but they are happy because they don't see happiness in these walls in these roofs, in the attraction of the dunya, the adornments of the dunya. They don't see them. They see happiness when they help each other, when the husband helps his wife, when the wife takes care of the children, the family, they build strong children. This is real happiness. Happiness is not with the bank account, with how much saving we have, how much you know, investments we have. Happiness is when you produce something moral, when you help, when you give, when you teach yourself to give. The more you give, the more you develop happiness. There was a survey or a study. The study, they wanted to find what is the most beautiful picture in this life, the most beautiful scene in this life. So they asked many people. They asked a pilot, the pilot said, when I look from my cockpit, I look at the mountains covered with the snow, I look at uh, the oceans, these are the most beautiful scenery. They asked a chef, he said, when I see people enjoy my cook, my food, when they sit in the restaurant and they enjoy, they munch like this, I enjoy. This is the most beautiful. This means that I did a great job. They asked a teacher. He said, when I look at children learn, they excel in knowledge. They graduate with honor. This is my best scenery, my best moment, my most beautiful scene. They asked a firefighter. He said, the day people come back to their homes and properties and they find them safe because we protected them. That scene is the most beautiful. I see the father, the mother, the kids, they come back. They allow them after evacuation, they come back home and they look at the house safe, intact. That is the most beautiful scene. They asked a benevolent person. He said, the most beautiful scene in this life is when I see a hungry person and I give him food and he eats that food. Or I find a shelter, I find a homeless with no shelter in the rain, in the snow, and I give him shelter. That is the most beautiful scene in this life. Is it true? That makes you happy. And this is exactly in this book. 
This sentence that this man said, it's in this book. وَمَنْ أَحْيَاهَا فَكَأَنَّمَا أَحْيَا النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا When you save a life, save it physically or morally. When you save a life as if you have saved the entire humanity. God gives you the credit of saving the entire humanity. وَمَنْ أَحْيَاهَا فَكَأَنَّمَا أَحْيَا النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا We should teach our children to be savers of others, builders of others. Teach your son and your daughter not to be selfish. Teach them to work for the betterment, for the advancement, for the happiness of those who are around them. How many people you make happy every day? It depends on your moral capacity. You don't have to be very rich. Neither you have to be very knowledgeable nor you have to be very influential. You don't have to be the mayor of Irvine. Through your own capacity. Sometimes you make them by giving them food. Sometimes by giving them a smile. Sometimes by greeting them. Sometimes by checking on them. Yesterday I read a survey on the BBC. They said many elderly in the UK they die during the winter time. Why? Because of the harsh conditions, harsh weathers. Nobody check on them. They live alone in their apartments. Many elderly in the United Kingdom. They die because they can't go out. Neither they can go out nor someone checks on them or call them. They die. They die out of depression and sadness and loneliness. Check it out. It's on the BBC, BBC site, BBC English, the English site. They die because of sadness. They live alone. Sometimes you can save someone by checking on them, knocking at their door. Are you okay? Do you want me to help you? You don't lose. You gain. وَمَنْ أَحْيَاهَا فَكَأَنَّمَا أَحْيَا النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا So, مَنْ كَانَ يُرِيدُ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا وَزِينَتَهَا نُوَفِّ إِلَيْهِمْ أَعْمَالَهُمْ فِيهَا We give them what they want. وَهُمْ فِيهَا لَا يُبْخَسُونَ They receive their full, their full reward in this life. But in the hereafter, because they never thought of the hereafter. They gain nothing, they get nothing there. أُولَئِكَ لَيْسَ لَهُمْ then let me go through number 17 in three minutes. Number 17 says that the Prophet has three proofs. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He carries with him three main evidences that he's the messenger of God. Evidence number one is his book, this book, book full of wisdom, book unrivaled, unmatched. Nobody can bring something similar to this book. They tried, but they couldn't. So, so, so this is a miracle. This is a miracle. This book provided that we read it, but many Muslims, they don't read it. They don't read it. They don't do tadabbur. They don't do reflection. Even those who read, they read without understanding, and therefore they don't enjoy it. When you watch a movie, but you don't enjoy it. The movie is in French, Italian, Spanish. You don't understand it. You are not going to enjoy the movie. So this is the first proof that the Prophet is the messenger of God, the Holy Book, the Holy Quran. The second the second that Muhammad is the messenger of God is وَمِنْ قَبْلِهِ كِتَابُ مُوسَىٰ إِمَامًا وَرَحْمًا The scriptures, previous scriptures, previous holy books such as the Torah, in the Torah, and I mentioned four weeks ago, in the book of Genesis and the book of De Deuteronomy, two places in the Torah mentions the arrival of Prophet Muhammad 
Each prophet God sent before his departure declared and announced and foretold the subsequent messenger, the one who is going to come after him. Each and every messenger. He mentioned this very publicly to his community. Prophet Muhammad, not only Jesus mentioned him, Moses mentioned him, and before Moses, Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim, it's a, in the book of Genesis, Ibrahim mentioned the arrival of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, these are two proofs. Proof number one, the book that he carries. Anyone with open-mindedness, anyone who understands the literature, when he reads this book, he knows Muhammad is the genuine messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the prophet. The second, the previous books. Guess what is the third one? A third evidence that says Muhammad is it truly the messenger of God. It's here in this book. It's written here. Which one? What he was wearing is one of them? Definitely not. The food he ate, definitely not. His house, his property, definitely not. So what is the third thing that tells you? If you study that third thing, if you study it, examine it, analyze it, you know the prophet is a truly the messenger of God. Beyond any doubt. This book says his followers... And it is meant by followers, يعني أمير المؤمنين علي يبن أبي طالب عليه الصلاة والسلام. If you look at the life of Imam Ali and his character and his personality and his honesty and his integrity, you will say that this man, Ali, cannot follow someone who's wrong. Impossible. Impossible for someone like Ali ibn Abi Talib to follow someone who's wrong. Someone who's not genuine. God says, this is in the Quran. How do we know, my friend, sometimes a message or a tradition is it true? Sometimes by looking at the tradition, the book of the tradition, sometimes by looking at the followers of the tradition. If the followers are honest and genuine, it means their religion is true. And this is what God says in this book. God says, look at someone like Ali ibn Abi Talib, you would realize beyond any doubt that the message of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is genuine. أَفَمَنْ كَانَ عَلَىٰ بَيِّنَةٍ مِنْ رَبِّهِ وَيَتْلُوهُ شَاهِدٌ مِنْهُ وَمِنْ قَبْلِهِ كِتَابُ مُوسَىٰ إِمَامًا وَرَحْمَةً أُولَٰئِكَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِهِ Those who follow the Prophet, people like Imam Ali, those who are genuine, those who are honest, those who don't cheat, it means the Prophet is truthful because they don't go into the wrong direction. They don't go. And this is a message to us that don't just say, I'm a Muslim. If your conduct is not Islamic, don't call yourself a Muslim. Don't. This is injustice to call yourself a Muslim while your conduct is not Islamic. If you want to be a true Muslim, then you have to follow. Only by following the Prophet, not just by subscription. Islam is not, we get a form and I put my name and I submit the name and I say I am a Muslim. No, there is no such a form. Islam is a relationship between you and God. The other day, a lady came here. She was, she wanted to convert but she was worried about her family, what her family are going to say about her. She's going to be an outcast. They look down at her because she downgraded herself when she becomes a Muslim. I said to her, you don't have to share it with your family. In Islam, we don't have baptism. We don't put you in a pool of water and then you know, take you out. No, we don't have nothing like that. No baptism in Islam. 
In Islam, you can build a relationship with God with no one knows about that. No one knows. Because it's between your heart and God. And your heart can be protected. No one knows about your heart. With your inner intention, you don't have to shout. Even if you say in your heart, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. So it's a relationship between you and God. No third party involved. You don't have to tell anyone. If you fear your family, don't share it. Don't share it with them. God is your protector. God is the main. The main friend in your life is God. You don't have to tell anyone. Build your relationship with God. Allahumma khfar lil mu'mineen wal mu'minat. Wal muslimin wal muslimat. Al ahya'i minhum wal amat. Tonight was the second anniversary of the departure of a good sister in the community. A good sister who has good sisters too. Good sisters, good brothers, good family, good parents. I can't believe it's a second anniversary. I can't believe. This is an indication that we are moving going to our final destination. And happy is the one who decides the type of departure, the, part, the type of exit. What do I mean by the type? Whether it is virtuous or non-virtuous. This is up to you. It's not up to me how I am going to die. This is what God decides. It could be accident, it could be natural death, it could be a disease, it could be drowning, it could be fire, it could be anything. It's not important. What is important, where I can decide, not just God, is whether I'm going to leave this life with a happy ending or terrible ending. This is in my control. And it does not happen overnight, believe me. We build this. We build this ending slowly, slowly. We build it every day. Every day, every hour we build this. Through what we say, through what we do, through what we give, and through our relationship with God and with the people. So if you are looking for a good ending, virtuous ending, leaving this life, where God is happy with you first and foremost, God should be happy with us then you have to work on that. You have to prepare yourself. May God bless her soul. May God, inshallah, enlighten her grave and make her grave a garden of paradise, inshallah. And join her with her father, with her mother, with those who left, already left from her family, this is what we say in Salatul Janaza. The most important sentence we say, we conclude Salatul Janaza is this. God, bestow mercy on us too because we are not going to stay after him or her longer except a few days. Believe me, except a few days. Allahumma khfar lil mu'minina wal mu'minat. My condolences to you, oh Yasei, oh Dr. Yasei, oh Dr. Ismail, and the honorable sisters, the honorable sisters who are very good, very virtuous. May Allah bless you all, inshallah, the whole family, the Yasei family. Allahumma khfar lil mu'minina wal mu'minat, wal muslimina wal muslimat, al ahya'i minhum wal amwat. Tabi illahumma baynana wa baynahum bil khayrat. إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك غافر الخطيئات إنك ماحي السيئات وجاعلها حسنات إنك على كل شيء قدير وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات برأي شادي روح مرحومة خانم من الجيه بحيد ياسائي الفاتحة مع الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد